doing is um, Laura put together a lot of images that are from the Gerard collection that I'm just going to run. And I know I said to her, I hate when people say, I'm just going to run the stuff and you'll see what I'm talking about when you see it. Well, I'm going to just run the stuff and you'll see what I'm talking about when you see it. Um, because I think it would be easier to do it that way. And it'll loop back. So um, I only have about 10 minutes, but you'll see it maybe twice, maybe three times. Um, so the... I, I came with the title, I Will Tell Your Story, um, and I'm just going to really talk more generally about collecting, so let's start going here. Um, this is a quotation um, from Gerard, The Whole World is a Hometown, uh, and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about um, are ways in which collecting is really about telling stories. And I'll start a little bit more with a little anecdote. So I have a 14-year-old, and we have been doing must-see movies from our generations, or movies we think each other should see. And we watched Citizen Kane um, a couple of weeks ago. And I started thinking about that again when I was preparing this talk, because as you know, that whole theme of when you go back and watch it, especially now with our presidency, it's very interesting. Um, he was a newspaper mogul, as you may remember, had a bad run for president, um, even though he, the plan was to increase his empire um, at, while he was going to be president. And um, also, if you watch the show Succession, totally based on some of the Citizen Kane things. So, But anyway, as you know, it was all about storytelling, that whole movie. He's constantly trying to acquire things to find his own lost story, right? And that's the whole you know, thing around Rosebud, right? Um, so that's what a lot of collecting is about. And remember all those amazing scenes in Citizen Kane where he's just there at the end where they're standing among uncrated um, things that he had bought from all over the world? And it was about the acquisition for him more than even actually um, opening them and putting them up. And then the amazing scenes where he's always so alone in that giant house filled with all of those collected objects. So storytelling is so much an integral part of, uh, of collecting for the collector, for the collected. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to focus on today. Um, and for instance, um, who can tell the story, right? And someone in the earlier panel mentioned that there shouldn't be labels in the Gerard collection because he is not trying to be anthropological. Um, and some of the great quotations, like you know, every um, you know, every the where's a home, hometown, but also how he felt that these were all about one of the quotations in the show um, that were there for his they were for his enjoyment. He's hoping that he can share it one day, which he did by by giving them. Uh, the objects here. Um, and that's where I wanted to get to uh, the importance of the miniature here, and we, that was touched on a little bit in the, uh, the earlier, uh, actually a large part of uh, the earlier session, and the whole idea of scale in terms of storytelling. Because what you need for a story is you need some sense of time, like a beginning, a middle, and end, um, and also more of a context. You know, sometimes stories are amazing because they kind of drop down out of time and they're just this amazing gem of a narrative. And other times, you're really wanting them to be placed within a larger set of stories. And one of the things that um, I went to is a book, everyone write this down right now. It's a book called On Longing. It's by a woman named Susan Stewart, all my museum folks know. I've used it in I think every single class I've ever taught. Um, mainly because it's not only a book about musings, about collecting, but it's also about all the things you collect, um, whether it's souvenirs, whether it's miniatures, whether it's um, textiles, whether it's teeth. <laughs> they talk, she talks about everything in that book. And so I'm just going to read to you um, some of these amazing quotes that I think are really relevant to looking at an entire um, room of miniatures that Gerard has offered to us. Um, so she says about the miniature, the miniature skews time and space um, in, in its relation to everyday life world activities because it is an object, the miniature is, that is consumed. 
and therefore its value is transformed into the infinite time of reverie. I think that that one in particular really hit home with me in terms of understanding the, at the core of why Girard was creating the, uh, collecting those objects and then wanting to share them. And then he actually says something very similar to that in the video in the, in the exhibition. The other thing she says about, these, about the miniature, the miniature's fixed form is manipulated by individual fantasy. Oh my God, I can't even read my own handwriting, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would have had the book if I weren't packed up and moved to different places. Um, the miniature's fixed form is manipulated by individual fantasy rather than by physical circumstance. Just, that's a good one, right? I think I'll read that again. The miniature fixed form is manipulated by individual fantasy rather than by physical circumstance. And that goes to what we saw um, in the earlier talk about the life-size um, dioramas versus the small, tiny ones. Uh, because you have this different relationship to them, they really are outside of time and space. Ironically, while they seem to be depicting a very specific time and space. Um, but our physical relationship to them distorts that. Um, here's another great one. The, miniature, uh, the miniature's time transcends the everyday life. I think I think it's not. Um, that's it. The, miniature the miniature's time transcends everyday life. And that, again, is how it's kind of stuck. Um, other things that I think are related also by Susan Stewart, um, are these wonderful, to think of these also as souvenirs, you know, that I know that um, some of them were actually bought while, you know, the fact that the story, the, the story about the collection for Girard is that he latched on to this discovery while on a honeymoon. So there the story is attached to a personal event um, and therefore is a type of souvenir. And Susan Stewart writes, the souvenir contracts the world in order to expand the personal, which I think also is wonderfully aligns with how he got started with creating that giant collection in there. It was something that started very personal and kept being that. Um, and I'll do my last quotation from her because now I hope you'll just go and buy the book, right? Um, about collections. The collection marks the space of nexus for all narratives, all storytelling. The place where history is transformed into space and also into property. And that's another thing where you have uh, with collecting, it's transactional, usually. Um, and that tra those transactions reverberate from when the object is purchased or acquired by a gift, um, and then if it keeps giving. And so that's where I wanted to move on to thinking about those images as, oh, that's a great one that I'm gonna mention right there. Um, that these are such an array of life experiences from that one right there is perfectly timed. Um, from life to death, there's also a funeral that's depicted. I think there may be more than one. Um, and so we're not only looking at many different cultures from all over the world, Russia, China, China Portugal, Peru, Poland, but we're also looking at different types of events from the lives of these people in these places. Um, and all of this comes in this, through this intersection of craft, um, whether it's depicting craft, um, like that marketplace um, scenario that was just pointed out to me. If you look at the end, you can see all the way down through this, looks like a global marketplace where many people are creating different things, food as well as objects, um, or people playing music. And something that I also think about these, if they're, these are created um, by people in those cultures, which is something that Bell Hooks would describe as native informants. Right? So when we're looking at it being in a museum that, and in an exhibition that we can say is curated by Girard, but the objects themselves are made by the people who are native informants, had some actual relationship to the cultures they're depicting. 
but you're just seeing their depiction. And something that I like to describe as maybe a, a cultural game of telephone is what we're seeing here, right? You know the game telephone where you say a phrase and you whisper it down through many different people and when you get to the end, you ask what that person heard and it usually is very different from the, the first word. So I started thinking about the fact that Gerard, in a very personal way, way curated what we're seeing here objects that were created by native informants, but those objects were also seen through the lens of the maker. So even the authority of the maker could be slightly questionable um, because it's just that person's point of view and their point of view that they were making representations for sale. So there are all these different complications when you think about what is the authentic representation that we're seeing over there? I mean, it's very easy to say, oh, he was not anthropologically accurate, but were the people making them anthropologically accurate? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and that's where we get into some of the slides I showed you that looked very strange. It was the Venus of Willendorf being held in a hand. That was the reference to the miniature. Um, and also, a close-up from one of these. Oh, it's going to come up right now. This is great. Um, let's see if we can have it. You'll see it for a minute. Um, oh, and this is just an example of bringing in um, other types of curators that are from... Oh, and this is a Fred Wilson, Mine in the Museum, was also mentioned. Um, one of his works, Mine and Yours, I thought is great about the miniature. So this is, these are all representations. And one of them was showing um, an image uh, from the Mexican tableau, I believe, that showed people that seemed to be of different ethnicities or stereotypes. So the back row had a bunch of men with mustaches and they were slightly darker skinned, and then the front row, there were different types of musicians that were lighter skinned. There's also in, I believe, the Portugal tableau, um, some very um, stereotypical images of a man of African descent with you know, the sort of grotesque large lips and those types of negative stereotypes that we associate with that. So one could say, why are you showing that, Gerard, to putting it in there? But this was cultural telephone. He's actually displaying something from Portugal that was made by a Portu Portuguese man or woman who created these. And that was their perception of um, people of African descent, of that artisan um, at that time. Um, so again, it's like another translation, another translation, all based around the different contexts in which we see these objects. Um, I think that was my cultural telephone part. Uh, just to say a little bit more about the Fred Wilson piece that you saw there. Um, we saw that earlier, uh, the Mining Museum from 1992, I believe, was when it was up. Oh, and this was another one of the images, actually, of the tourists taking the pictures. Uh, that's another representation of the cultural telephone, right? So they're taking their images that then will go back and be shown in a different context of what they were seeing. But the Fred Wilson piece, um, you might notice that uh, in that one there, um, objects that are made by people who are being represented as well as by European Americans, such as the images of the Native American cigar store Indians, and he made a point of curating them where they're, they're facing away from us. So they're turning their backs on us and actually looking at images of actual Native Americans. Um, so that is another way in which um, the artist is a curator that was mentioned earlier. I think I'll stop here because that's my little bit of a context. And I hope to ask more questions of our speakers later. Thank you.